first, I want to do a little mental exercise with you. Can we do that together? All right, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to imagine you're at your favorite place, your favorite place to like just relax and do your thing. Maybe it's a hiking trail. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's shopping for you. Maybe that's your thing. Uh, maybe it's a restaurant that you love to go to. Maybe um, I've heard a lot of good things about cruise ships, uh, vacation spots, wherever you, whatever your place is that you love to go, just imagine you're there. Okay, so imagine you're there in this place, and then all of a sudden, while you're in that place, God starts to really put something on your heart. And he's not just putting like a word of encouragement. He's not just saying, I love you. He's actually putting it on your heart and in your mind to go talk to that person over there. In other words, God is asking you now in your favorite spot to get out of your comfort zone and go talk to somebody about Jesus, to go tell them about your faith. How would you feel? If you were a normal human being, you would argue with God. And you would say, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't even know that person. So now you argue with God and you tell him, nope, I'm not going to do it because I don't know what to say. I'm an introvert. Whatever excuse that we can bring up, we start to say, God, I can't do this. I'm going to look weird. And we argue with him. But then he really starts to press it on him. He said, listen, I don't want you to just go tell him about your faith. I want you to go pray for that person. And he doesn't let up. He keeps going. Now I want you to imagine that you actually do it. You go to that person and you say, hey, my name's, I'm going to use Josh because that's who I am. My name's Josh. I know this is going to sound crazy, but God told me to come pray for you. Is, is there anything that you need prayer for? And then imagine they respond back and says, actually, yeah, I do need prayer for something. And they start to tell you, maybe it's, yeah, you know, my marriage is on the rocks. We're not getting along and we need healing there. Maybe they actually have a broken arm or broken leg or something. And they say, actually, I'd love healing for this. Maybe they have a family member that has cancer and they want to seek healing for that. Then out of faith, you say, see how I'm scared? Can I pray for you right now? And they say yes. So you pray for them. As you pray for them, you ask God to bring healing for whatever it is. Now for this example, let's assume it's somebody in a wheelchair. They're paralyzed. Car accident, haven't walked in years. And they say, I'd love to walk again. And then you pray for them. This is your favorite spot. This is the place to relax. There's a whole crowd watching you. Everybody's there, and you're scared to death, but God's telling you, and so you pray for him. In Jesus' name, get up and walk. And what if they did? What if they got up and walked? So now I want to ask you, how would you feel if going through all of that, you actually saw somebody get healed? They got up out of their wheelchair. How would you feel? Would you feel excited? Would you cheer? Would you clap? Would you, if you're also normal, you'd probably go, oh my gosh, I didn't expect that to work. It actually happened. What if they tell you something along the lines of, actually, you know, my faith with God has been on the rocks too, and I need to get right with him, and you pray for that. Would you feel excited? Most of us would probably feel a mix of all of the emotions that we just experienced, right? The fear, the anxiety of going through with it. We'd probably feel um, excitement because God actually did something. We, all of the different things mixed together. But at the end of the day, God chose to use you in this example. And the reason I'm leading off with this story is because one of the things that the church neglects, and when I say the church, I mean just kind of like the church in general, not us specifically, but the church in general is the importance of evangelism. How many of you are excited to be evangelists? Yep, every time I ask that question, the same amount of hands usually goes up. And for those who are watching online, that was zero. Most people are not excited to go tell people about their faith. Most people are not excited and anxious to go bring the power and presence of God, to take the kingdom of God 
into the kingdom of darkness and wage spiritual war on it. Most of us don't want to do that. But did you know it is the thing that Jesus asked his church to do? We just finished, right, uh, Passover week, we, uh, I'm sorry, Holy Week, with Jesus coming into the temple, Passover, the crucifixion, um, the resurrection. We just celebrated that. When you, when you celebrate leading up to the resurrection, it feels like it's the end of the story. But it's not the end of the story. In reality, Jesus' resurrection is kind of the beginning of the story. Because his church is going to be birthed in Acts chapter 2 after his ascension. The church is going to start doing miracles all throughout Jerusalem, Samaria, and the rest of the world. And that story, that continuation of our story from Jesus' resurrection is till today. Because he tells his disciples that he is going to come back and he hasn't come back yet. Which means you and I are in part two of this story. We are living in the sequel right now. When Jesus is prepping his disciples, he promises to send somebody. And that person he promises to send is the Holy Spirit. You'll notice in the example, we talked about God pushing on your heart, right? God putting something here. That's the work of the Holy Spirit at play. It's the Holy Spirit that did the healing. It's the Holy Spirit that arranged the entire scene. We're now entering a season called Pentecost, which is the 50-day period between Jesus' ascension and the, I'm sorry, a resurrection and then the uh, appearance of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is a very, very important person of the Trinity. One of my favorite verses we can, um, I don't know if it's going to be up here on the screen because I don't think I sent it to my team. John 16, 7. Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, very truly I tell you it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Holy Spirit will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. And so part two of this story of Jesus' resurrection was him then ascending into heaven and him sending the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that's been in operation in us. But if Jesus says this about the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit must be important, right? And if the Holy Spirit is important, that means we not only have to press in, but we've got to understand who he is. And I think sometimes for us as believers, he is difficult to understand. I think the reason he's difficult to understand is because, A, he's a rather abstract uh, person, right? He's invisible. He's omnipresent, omniscient, all the things. But we can't touch the Holy Spirit. We can't see him. But nonetheless, he's still important. And even through that, we got to figure out who he is. So who is he? Well, I think the most important thing for us to know is that the Holy Spirit is, in fact, God himself. He is the Trinity. Let's go ahead and show that, uh, the graphic really quickly of the Trinity. And the reason we're going through this is because I do think the church sometimes forgets how important the Holy Spirit is. But he is, in fact, God himself, right? God exists as three persons in one being, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is that person of God who is dwelling with us. And this person of God is not a force. I think sometimes we accidentally think that the Holy Spirit is kind of like this nebulous force thing that kind of moves church people around, but he's not. He's a person of the Godhead. That means he has thoughts. He has feelings. He has a will. Paul tells us that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. Interesting. Uh, This person of the Trinity who has thoughts, will, and emotion, he now interacts with us. He tells us his words. He tells us what he wants to do. And he is very important to us because he is, in fact, God with us right now. You remember we talked about the veil being torn during communion and uh, how that allows us to get into the glory of God. Well, when Jesus ascends and he sends us the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwells in us at that moment. In other words, that place where the curtain was torn, behind that was called the Holy of Holies. That was the most sacred spot in all of Israel, in all of Judaism. Once that veil was torn, you and I become the Holy of Holies because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. So Jesus tells us he's important. He tells us he's going to send the Holy Spirit to us. And you might be asking yourself at this point, okay, well, if he is God, if he dwells in us, and he is important, what does he do? Because that begs the question, right? If he is so important, well, what makes him important? Well, one of the first things is, is he's the one who is key in our sanctification. Sanctification is just a fancy word for us to being made more like Jesus. 
He's the one that's working inside of us. He convicts us of sin. He's the one who encourages us to abstain from it. He's the one that uh, is inside, like encouraging us to read our Bibles more, to spend more time with God in worship, so forth and so on. The Holy Spirit prays for us. He intercedes for us, Paul tells us. The Holy Spirit is the one that gives us spiritual gifts, things like prophecy, healing, words of knowledge, those gifts to build the kingdom of God. That's what he does. And ultimately, that's what the Holy Spirit does, is build the kingdom of God. And so that's what we're going to be looking at, is what the Holy Spirit does in the building of the kingdom of God, right? Because he is the driving person behind all of our evangelism. So with that, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John 15, 26. I want to show you what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. So remember, we said this is part two, the spot that we're in. So now we're going to do like a previously on segment where we go back to the last few days of Jesus because that's where Jesus is telling his disciples about the Holy Spirit. So this conversation comes from the Passover meal. It comes from that last time when Jesus is eating with his disciples just before he was betrayed. And after they do Passover together, after they have the meal, Jesus then teaches them these things. And he says this, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. So it's a short little verse, but here Jesus starts to talk about this person of the Holy Spirit. And he calls him uh, the advocate. He calls him somebody who's going to come and start to do things with the disciples and do things with the world. And one of the things the Holy Spirit is going to do is he's going to start to show the world who Jesus is. He's going to start to reveal truth to people. Later on, it'll tell us that the Holy Spirit's actually going to start convicting the world of sin. So he's still a very, very important person, and he's doing all of these works. And he also tells the disciples that when he sends the Holy Spirit, not only is the Holy Spirit going to do these things, but testifying about Jesus, but notice who else. This is in verse 27. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. In other words, Jesus is telling the disciples, I'm going to send you this Holy Spirit, the advocate. And when he comes, he's going to testify about me. And by the way, disciples, you guys are going to testify about me as well. Now, I want you to imagine being in their situation. Remember, we set up that place where we're in our comfort zone. We're in a place that we absolutely love, hiking trail, whatever, something like that. And then the Holy Spirit breaks in and says, I want you to testify. At that particular moment, we might be terrified. Because if we were to do it on our own, we would probably mess up, right? Let me ask you the show of hands. How many of you are worried about evangelizing and telling people about the faith because you don't know what to say? Okay, great. So there's a number of hands that went up. How many of you don't want to do it because you feel like you don't know enough scripture to actually talk about Jesus? Okay, good. Some more hands went up. Let me tell you guys, that's okay. And that's actually a fun, not fun, but it's a good place to be. As we look at later, it's going to mean that we have to rely on the Holy Spirit even more. But what Jesus tells us about the Spirit in this verse is that he is the advocate. Now, in the Greek, and this is one of those times where the Greek word actually shows us a little bit more about who the Holy Spirit is here, that word is paraclete. Paraclete basically means somebody who is called to one's aid. It's somebody that's supposed to come and help you. In modern terms, we can think of it as our wingman. The person who's right there watching our back who's going to help us. If you love Lord of the Rings, he's the Samwise Ganji to our Frodo. That's who the Holy Spirit is. And so Jesus is sending us this helper who's going to testify, but he's also going to help us in that testifying about Jesus. So that's the purpose of the Holy Spirit. This is before Jesus was killed. Well, then Jesus was killed, and then he resurrected. And then after his resurrection, he's walking around, he's doing some more miracles, he's eating, he's teaching, he's doing a bunch of things. But before we can just, like, emphasize uh, evangelism, we have to understand that Jesus emphasized it too. So let's look at Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Some of you may know this passage. It's the Great Commission. Now remember, this is just before Jesus went up to heaven. 
So this is kind of like Jesus' last will and testament. It's the final words to his disciples before he leaves. It's the thing that he wants them to remember most. And he says this. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Clearly, Jesus is emphasizing the importance of the disciples going out to make more disciples. These are the final words he has to his disciples. And I also want to emphasize the point that if your parents or grandparents in the room, look, your primary discipleship group are your kids and then your grandkids. That's your primary discipleship group. But here in Matthew, Jesus is saying that we need to go into the world. We have to go out there and find people to make disciples of Jesus. And it's not just in Matthew. He says it again in Luke 24, 46 through 49. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So let's pause right there. So Jesus is saying after his resurrection, he was supposed to die. He was supposed to come back to life and that this message will be preached to all nations. Who's doing the preaching? You are. The disciples are the one that's supposed to do that preaching. But then Jesus says again, I am going to send you what my father has promised, which is the Holy Spirit. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power on high. So Jesus is telling his disciples in all of these passages that we just looked at, two very important things. Number one, your primary job is to make disciples. Your primary job in my absence is to be evangelists. And the second thing that he says, the second thing he tells them is, I'm not going to leave you alone to do this by yourselves. I am going to send you the Holy Spirit. In this verse, Jesus is tying the presence of the Holy Spirit and evangelism together. I want us to think about this for a minute. When Jesus tells his disciples, you are going to be evangelists and I am going to send you the Holy Spirit, he puts the two together. Think about what he said in John. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit who's going to testify and you also will testify. The presence of the Holy Spirit and evangelism go together. Why am I emphasizing this point? I think for those of us, and sometimes as as folks in the vineyard that desire the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, we can too eagerly just want to come to a Sunday service or a small group or something like that to experience the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, but never actually go out into the streets and take the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to the people that are in need. We become Holy Spirit hoarders. And we want to keep him to ourselves. It's not that we like say like, he's mine, he's mine, he's mine. It's just that we allow all of the other things to get in the way of our evangelism. But Jesus is very clear that the Holy Spirit, his power and presence, and the proclamation of the gospel testifying about Jesus go hand in hand. They cannot be separated. And we don't want to become Holy Spirit hoarders. But the other side of this is a very convicting thing. That if you are going to say that you were a disciple of Jesus and that you have received the Holy Spirit, then evangelism for you is not an option. Sometimes we think to ourselves, well, I don't have the gift of evangelism. We look at guys like Billy Graham or out in California, there's a guy, Greg Laurie. He's also really gifted in, in speaking gospel messages. And we look at these big guys and we say to ourselves, well, I don't have those kinds of gifts. I don't have that gifting. Josh, are you really saying that I have to evangelize? Yes. Yes, I am. And just for the record, it's not me that's saying it. It's Jesus. It's Jesus that's going to do it. But let me tell you, it's going to be okay. And this is where we get into Acts. The book of Acts is a fabulous story of all of the things that the disciples did through the power of of the Holy Spirit. So let's open up to chapter one and see what God, what Jesus has to say here. 
in verse 1. He says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. So let me pause really quickly. This author of the book of Acts is Luke. Luke is the one who famously wrote the gospel of Luke. And notice what he says, in my former book. In other words, Acts is volume 2 of Luke. I know it doesn't look that way when you're flipping through your Bible, but in reality, it would be an awesome adventure to read the entire book of Luke and then read the entire book of Acts because it is, in fact, the sequel. He says in verse 2, until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You'll kind of notice right there in those last few verses we just looked at that they're very similar to Luke 24 that we just looked at. This is Luke kind of recapping the story for us. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And what the disciples are asking him is, hey, you're the Messiah. And we thought we were toast when you got crucified, but now you're resurrected. So that means death can't hold you down. So that means you're going to overthrow Rome, right? You're going to overthrow them, kick them out, and we're going to be able to be the kingdom of Israel again under our own rule, under our own theocracy with you as our king. They were super excited and hopeful for this. And then Jesus says, uh, don't worry about that. It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. In other words, don't worry about that stuff. Don't worry about that at all. This next thing that I'm going to tell you about, that's what I want you to worry about. That's what I want you to focus on. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Now, in this one, I just have to defend the disciples a little bit here. If you saw a guy float up into the sky, that's like a kid that loses their helium balloon. They just keep looking and gawking. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken away from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Here in this opening verses, Luke basically sets up part two of the story. Jesus in his earthly ministry did all of these things. Then he instructed the disciples on the Holy Spirit. And then later on, he will come back the same way he left. And in the meantime, we are living in that sequel part of Jesus' story. But this verse is a great verse because it reminds us that when we receive the Holy Spirit, he's not only our wingman, he's not only our helper, he's not only the one that's going to call to mind the things that Jesus has taught us, the things that we've read in scripture, or that God might want to say. But he is telling them that you will receive power. I want you to say that with me one more time. You will receive power. Now say it like you have power. Power. That's what the Holy Spirit is bringing to us. He is giving us power. And yet again, Jesus is tying the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to evangelism. You will be my witnesses in your hometown, in the outskirts of your hometown, to the edge of the country, and to the world. That's what we're supposed to do. And as we see again, we cannot separate the two. The other thing that is important for us is that here Jesus is telling us the Holy Spirit is a gift. The Holy Spirit is a gift from God. If we don't operate in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, we're neglecting the gift that God gave us. It's like a kid who receives a bicycle on Christmas and sets it in the corner. What good is it if they don't ride the bike? What good is the Holy Spirit if we don't let him do the things that Jesus sent him to do for us? So yes, you are called to evangelize. I think we've emphasized that point well enough. And you might be saying to yourself at this point, okay, but Josh, I just don't know if I can do it. 
We all make excuses for evangelism, right? And I'm going to go through a couple of them right now. Some of you, you might be afraid to do evangelism. You might be afraid. You might be afraid that you don't know enough, like we said earlier, and folks raise their hand. You might be afraid that you're going to say the wrong things. You might be afraid that you're going to get made fun of. You might be afraid of, and you can make the list of the things. But oftentimes we use fear as an excuse. It stops us from doing the work of the kingdom. Another one that we can often get into is I'm too busy. We get caught up in the busyness of life and we don't do the things that God wants us to do. I will never forget this story. Some of you may have heard it before. But back years ago when I was still a teacher, I would always run late because I stopped at Starbucks to get my coffee before I went to school uh, to do my teaching thing. Well, this one time I was at Starbucks, I got my coffee, and per the usual, I was running a little, a little bit behind, I drive quickly. And as I walk into, I see a homeless guy off to the side, and I get that impression on my heart, pray for that man. And I go, okay, after I get my coffee. So I go in, I get my overpriced coffee, and I walk out, and I see him again, and I feel that impression. And you know what I did? I made excuses. I made excuses to God. I said, I'm going to be late. I have to get to work. So I got in the car, drove to work, and I didn't pray for that guy. Now, I'd seen him there a couple of times before. So the next day, I say, I felt so guilty. I said, okay, God, next time, I'll pray for that guy. So I went to Starbucks again, and he wasn't there. Like, I'll try the next day. And I went, and he wasn't there. Never saw him again. I have no idea what God wanted to do in that moment. I have no idea what that guy needed. But I know this. I was a follower of Jesus. I heard the Holy Spirit give me something very clear, and I chose to make excuses. I'm too busy. Some of you might say to yourself, well, I'm an introvert. I can't go talk to people about Jesus. I'm not an extroverted person. I've said this before and I'll say it again. If I were the devil, and I'm not, I would convince the church that they're introverts. That's what I would do. Now, if you consider yourself to be an introverted person, we'll get to that in a second. Social anxiety. This is a new one for me uh, within the last like several years. People that struggle with social anxiety. Like I can't talk to people because it becomes so anxious for me. I can't do it. Maybe we say to ourselves, I don't want to look weird. I don't know what to say, like we said before. Just with all of these excuses, let me give you, just really quickly, some gentle, pastoral encouragement. Get over yourself. Get over yourself. You are not that important, okay? And we all need to have an extra dose of humility, myself included. I'm not that important to the kingdom of God. Let me rephrase that. That came out a little wrong. Yes, we are important to the kingdom of God, but it doesn't rest on my shoulders to do the heavy lifting. No, in fact, oftentimes, God chooses to use people that don't have the gifting for what he wants them to do. Think about Moses. Moses said, I'm slow to speech. Okay, one of the greatest leaders in Israel's history. How about David? Shepherd boy. Sure, he killed lions and bears with his bare hands. Haven't achieved that level yet. But a shepherd boy, chosen to be king, God oftentimes chooses the foolish to confound the wise. And let me say this one more time. You are not that important. If you think you all have all these deficiencies, good. It's a good thing that you think you have these deficiencies because Jesus tells us that the Holy Spirit will give you power. That power doesn't come from you. That power comes from him. I used to do street evangelism, and I loved going out there just to argue with people. That was, you couldn't imagine it, right? But I just loved to go out and argue with people, and I remember the pride that I would have because I had the right answer that I heard from Josh McDowell. Oh, I've got that apologetic ready to go. And I would get prideful and arrogant because I had the right things to say. 
some of you in this room, you might not have the right things to say, which is great because that makes more room for the Holy Spirit to speak instead of you. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 12. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Listen to what Paul said. Christ told him, my grace is sufficient. Why? Because my power is made perfect in your weakness. If you've got nothing to say, if you're an introvert, if you're a coward, God wants to use you. Think about that. He wants to use the socially anxiety-ridden introverted cowards to do the work of the kingdom. And the reason is, is because in your weakness, the power of the Holy Spirit will be magnified. And that magnification of the Spirit's power is going to turn right around and glorify Christ. That's why if you say any of these excuses that we just listed, stop using them as excuses and, stop using, and start using them as bragging rights. Verse 10, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. I'm an introvert. Awesome. That means I get to go talk to strangers about Jesus. It's going to be horrible for me. I'm going to be sick to my stomach. But that's awesome because Christ is going to look better. I'm afraid I don't know what to say. What if I say something wrong? I haven't studied scripture that well. I haven't gone to seminary or Bible college. How am I going to tell somebody about Jesus? I'm not. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit do it for me. Maybe you're afraid of looking weird. If I go do this, people are going to make fun of me. They're going to think I'm weird. No one's going to want to eat with me at lunch if they're students. My coworkers aren't going to want to socialize with me anymore. I could lose clients. Awesome. Because the Holy Spirit's going to look even better at the end of it. I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in the hardships, in the persecutions, and in the difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And Christ's strength is made even more. See, the presence of the Holy Spirit is what empowers every single one of us in this room to overcome those excuses for the kingdom of God. That's why he's important. But what we can't ever do is think that somehow this power is going to come apart from the presence. That means that if we're going to operate in this power, we have to seek his presence. And that seeking comes from waiting and seeking. Remember what Jesus told the disciples. Go to Jerusalem and wait. Go to Jerusalem and wait. And while you're in that waiting place, the Holy Spirit will visit you. So I think we've pretty much established we have to evangelize, correct? Okay, so we all agree that we don't have a choice in the matter, that we have to do it. We also agree that we might be scared, that it's going to be weird. We don't know what to do necessarily. But we've also agreed and seen that it doesn't matter because the power of the Holy Spirit is going to fill the gap. He's going to be doing the heavy lifting. But now the question is, what can we actually do? How can I actually go out there and evangelize in a way that's meaningful and that's practical? Well, let me give you some couple of things that will help you out. Um, we're going to start with this thing that I'm calling the Big Five. Uh, for those who are new to the vineyard, one of our, uh, our founder, John Wimber, had an incredible gift for taking complex theological kingdom ideas and putting them into a sentence that everybody could remember. Short little phrases that stick with us, that allow us and equip us to do the things of the kingdom. And one of his favorites is, the meat is in, see, and some of you, are, they were able to finish it. The meat is in the street. What does that mean? That means that the actual meat of the gospel 
the actual meat of the kingdom of God isn't here, although there is meat here, but the real meat is out there, doing the stuff of the kingdom of God. Go back to your story, right? When we said, imagine you're in your play, your happy place, and Holy Spirit decides to interrupt it. When you thought about praying for somebody and healing, excitement probably rose up. When you thought about talking to somebody who received the, uh, Jesus for the first time, hopefully you were elated with joy. That's the meat. That's what we're talking about. The other one is faith is spelled R-I-S-K. We understand that the meat of the kingdom is out there, but if we're going to do the things of the kingdom, if we're going to operate and live our lives in faith, there is risk involved with faith. Like Paul wrote in uh, 2 Corinthians, yeah, people will insult you. That's almost not even a risk, it's a guarantee. (laughs) Somebody's going to make fun of you. Somebody's going to think you're weird. You might not know what to say. You might pray for healing, and you did it on your own, and the Holy Spirit doesn't show up. That's the worst. Faith is spelled R-I-S-K. This is one of my favorites. I I just love this one. We're all change in God's pockets. Okay, for the young ones in the room, change, there's like these things called coins that we used to carry around. You might remember them. They're, They're metal. I think they're still metal. And... We, we would use these to pay for things. It wasn't just a card that we swiped or, or our phones. We used these to pay for things. And the idea here is that God's pockets is just full of nickels and quarters and dimes. And you're one of them. And wherever God is going to choose to spend you is where he's going to use you. We're changing God's pockets. And if you recognize that you're changing God's pocket, that when that opportunity comes before you and you feel the Holy Spirit tugging on you, you know it's him. You can say, all right, I'm a coin. I'm ready to be spent by God. The other one is naturally supernatural. In other words, we allow the Holy Spirit to do the heavy lifting. We allow him to pave the road for us. We wait for His prompting, we don't try to manufacture anything on our own, right? When we say evangelism, we're not talking about going out there with tracks, right? Ambush evangelism. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about, and for the love of God, we are not talking about sandwich boards and megaphones. That is not what we're talking about. We're talking about letting the Holy Spirit lead and guide the interactions and be present in those interactions. Evangelism is weird enough. We don't need to make it weirder naturally supernatural and some of you already know the last one that's for you know the last one i'm going to say when it comes to evangelism i'm a fool for christ whose fool are you everybody has somebody that thinks they're an idiot right if i asked you right now to say name me five people that think you're an idiot you can probably name them you start with family (laughs) you can move to friends But in all seriousness, if we were to ask ourselves, who are the five people that think I'm an idiot, you can probably name them. You will always have people in your life that think you're a fool. You will always have people that think you're an idiot. But if you're being a fool and an idiot for the sake of Christ, it's worth it. Because everybody's an idiot to somebody. And I'd rather be known as an idiot for Christ than for myself. I'm a fool for Christ. Whose fool are you? So what I would encourage you to do is remember these five quips because they're very encouraging to us. Faith is risk. So if you're going to do it, you better buck up for the risk. It's just part of the game. The meat is in the streets. That's where you're going to find fulfillment. That's where you're going to find the joy of the kingdom life. Change in God's pockets. You're at his disposal, not yours. Naturally supernatural. Let the Holy Spirit initiate, guide, and move throughout the day. Don't try to force anything to happen. And it doesn't matter because every, somebody's going to look at you like you're a fool. And if they look at you like you're a fool for the sake of Christ, it is 100% worth it. So we can remember those five things. How do we actually do it, though? How can we put these five principles into practice? Well, the first is start spending time in God's presence, right? As we said, the power comes from the presence. Don't underestimate the importance of things like worship, reading our Bibles, prayer, listening. It all takes practice. Start by living your day with expectation. Now, this is a scary one. I promise you it is. 
live your day with expectation. What does that mean? It means you wake up in the morning and you say to yourself, I cannot wait to see what God's going to use me for today. I can't wait to see how he's going to spend and use me. And you begin each day by saying, God, Holy Spirit, what do you have for me today? And the reason I say that's scary is because he probably has something. And as soon as you ask him, what do you have for me today? He's going to show you something that he has for you today. And now you're on the hook to follow through. There's no coasting on this one. Then you have to be looking and listening. The next thing that I would encourage everybody to do is to practice an evangelism challenge. And what I mean by evangelism challenge is set a goal, set a number goal. I know it's not like sales tactics or anything like that, but if we're just honest, goal setting works. And that's why. Set a goal to pray for one person a week. Just one person a week. Ask God, ask this type of thing. So when I say evangelism, I, you're right, I'm not talking about tracks, I'm not talking about anything. I'm talking about bringing the power and presence of the Holy Spirit right into the mix. And so if you're the type that you don't know what to say, if you're the type that you don't know what to do or how to, great, perfect. That's awesome. Do this. When God tells you and shows you the person, go up to that person and say, hey, I feel like God told me to pray for you. So if there's anything that God can do for you right now, what would that be? And let them say it. They might say something like, my grandma has cancer. They might say something like, I want to win the lottery. Just pray for it. But whatever they say, and, and by the way, I do this, um, and I have used this a lot, and I've never had anybody say, I want to win the lottery. Almost every single time they step back and go, actually, I do need prayer. And it catches them off guard. But most of the time when you come with something to give rather than something to sell, people are much more receptive. If God can do one thing for you right now, what would it be? And once they give you the answer, you ask them, can I pray for you right now? Not later, not okay, I'll pray for that. But can I pray for you right now? So if you write down those questions, if you write down those things, hey, God told me to pray for you. Um, if there's anything God can do for you right now, what would it be? And then can I pray for that right now? Do you notice what's happened here? You've become the middleman. You're not the star of the show anymore. It's not about you knowing un enough scripture. It's not about you knowing the three circles. It's not about you knowing the gospel plan or the story of the Bible or anything like that. It's nothing like that. What you've done is say, hey, God wants me to pray for you. Can I pray for you? They say yes, and then you start to pray, and what you've done is facilitated the interaction between them and God. You have now just invited the Holy Spirit into the prayer and into this conversation to do the heavy lifting. You become the middleman. You become not the star of the show. So as we close, I want to leave us with this one last thought. The Holy Spirit is a gift from Jesus. If we're going to take this gift seriously, and if we're going to love and treasure the gift of the Holy Spirit, then we have to utilize the gift of the Holy Spirit by operating in his power and in his presence. And if we take Jesus' word seriously, and if we're going to take him at his word, then we don't have a choice. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we go out into the world to bring his power and presence to a world in need. Are you willing to be a disciple that disciples? Let's stand. So as we make space for the Holy Spirit, let's hold out our hands like we're ready to receive that gift. And just pray that simple prayer, come Holy Spirit. 
Holy Spirit, fill this room with your presence. Let us feel your power and your ministry this morning. there's two groups that that God wants to work with right now and the first is somebody that heard this and you're like yeah I actually do want to do evangelism I recognize the importance of it I understand what Jesus said and yeah I want to be about that but I don't have the boldness I don't have the courage all the other excuses that go along with it. And this morning, the Holy Spirit wants to fill you with His presence, but also His power to give you that boldness. I think the other group, some other folks might be in the place where you heard the Scriptures, you heard what Jesus says, but you still don't want to do it. You don't want to tell people about Jesus. Jesus. You don't want to go and pray for the person that God tells you to pray for. But you do want the Holy Spirit to change your heart in that way. So what I'm going to ask is for anybody who's in those two categories to come forward. And as you come forward, right here in front of the tables. We'll have our prayer team members come around and pray for you. Especially to those that want boldness. Because if you want boldness, you gotta start taking bold steps. That means letting the Holy Spirit do what he wants to do. So come Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. morning we had, um, we get together for prayer and we listen to the Holy Spirit and he gives us words for healings and different words for encouragement. So this morning we had a bunch of words for healing. We have uh, something wrong with somebody's left ear. Uh, We also had a word for a left knee, something going on with the left knee. Somebody that's struggling with blood pressure issues and that's related to dizziness that you're experiencing. We also had a word for TMJ and hoarseness in the throat. So again, as we're waiting here in this moment, if you want prayer for any of those things as we read these words, come forward, let our prayer team pray for you. We also had a couple words. One was for... um, a marriage, somebody here is strife in the marriage. There's a lots of arguing and fighting, and you want healing for that. And this word is my favorite. Because when the person spoke this word, they had no idea what the message was about today. The word is for somebody in this room, you get the sense that nobody wants to hear from you. From you. you feel less than, not worthy enough to speak up. And the word of encouragement is that God wants you to be his mouthpiece. God wants to use you to speak for him. So as we sing this next chorus, if any of those words were for you, if you want to respond to any of those types of things, come forward, receive from the Holy Spirit, let him do his thing. So come Holy Spirit.
Spirit, we thank you for your move this morning. Jesus, we thank you that you've invited us in to be a part of your story. And so this morning we say we want to honor you with our lives. We want to honor the gift of the Holy Spirit that you have given to us. So Holy Spirit, fill us with your power, your boldness, and your courage to testify and to tell the world about Jesus. To take the kingdom of God into the streets and to a world in need. Encourage us to let us know that our deficiencies are assets because you get to shine more. Help us to overcome our excuses and turn them into bragging rights. Holy Spirit, we ask that you use us to glorify Jesus. Show us the people to pray for. Show us the people to share our faith with. Jesus, it's all for your glory. It's all in honor of you and for your kingdom. We say these things in your name. Amen. So let me encourage you, if you haven't received prayer yet, but you still like to come forward for anything at all, please do. Our prayer team's here. They'd love the opportunity to pray for everybody else. I pray that you have a very blessed week. Thank you.